Welcome. This is a May 21st Jail and Zones production user call. We have Dan, Jan, Dave, Mohammed, Jamie, and myself, Michael. And hey, everyone, BSD CAN is next week. It is not too late to register, although flights will probably be brutally expensive. So take the train, except there might be some disruptions around Montreal. Um, I will be a little busy, but Antrenik says he can probably help out with the calls and would actually love to see a boots on the ground tour of what BSD can looks like firsthand. Uh, Jan, you just noticed that Jamie has tickled the uh, jail descriptors review. Is that uh, in response to feedback or something new? Just new catching up. Number. Go ahead. Just catching up with the uh, library changes in FreeBSD that uh, it wasn't compiling in current anymore because of the uh, libsys stuff. So nothing, nothing new in the actual code, just making it work. Cool. Ah, cool. So I can pull this back into my builds again. Great. Thank yes. you. So it sounds like, Dave, you gave it a go? Not with the new, not with the new stuff. No, it stopped for a while. Yep. Cool. I'll send you a picture from the Kiwi tomorrow. There he is. Uh, oh, cool. Yes. As you've asked. I showed i didn't ask but there is apparently a very large uh, kiwi in yerevan and uh we have a kiwi on the call do you want to explain the history of that ever so briefly uh i don't know if i can do it briefly no uh -oh. um, new zealand's um sort of um animal symbol is a is a kiwi which is a relatively large flightless bird mainly known for two things a very long beak but also it has the largest egg to body ratio in the world Ouch. um i think of, of anything um they're nocturnal so most people haven't seen one i've had the rare privilege of seeing one in the daytime deep in the wilderness far away from anybody one just ran in front of me um and the word kiwi has been picked up and used in multiple things it's become kiwi fruit when the new zealand government decided it needed to brand what were previously called Chinese gooseberries to help in marketing. Okay. Um, and yep. it's become a colloquial name for New Zealanders everywhere. Kiwis. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we have a, we have a large cascade complex in Armenia, which outside of it is a, a museum and inside of it is also a museum, which also brings works from like Van Gogh and similar things every once in a while. Uh, partially funded by the U.S. taxpayers. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, and we have a large kiwi, which, which like, it's it's bigger than mine. It's, like, very, very big. It's the size okay. of a house, practically. Oh, no, Sorry, the size of a car, practically. And I will send a picture, me standing next to it during the week. Ah, uh, okay. Very famous place of the, the Cascade. Yes. Yep, there you go. That's the our kiwi. kiwi. And that's the complex of the Cascade. Dave, are you a New Zealander? I am corrected. I believe we have two New Zealanders. Uh, go ahead, Dan uh, or Dave. You're Dave, from the island. You're a New Zealander. Yeah. I'm a I'm a real New Zealander, but Dan is an honorary New Zealander. <laughs> go I, I immigrated to New Zealand shortly after university, and after four years there, I was able to get New Zealand citizenship, and lived there from eighty five to two thousand and one. I'm not not trying to go into any of that, but just hearing Dave mention it, I, I was wondering. I, I had already never assumed he was New Zealand. The only thing that we Armenians know about New Zealand is the Kiwi and that some members of System of a Down are New Zealand citizens. That That's all we know. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, back on track, but do interject yes. as appropriate. So... Uh, Jan, what's this about Hesiod not building? Is that one of the many uh, build options? It's Let's a, see if I've got on the list. It's there. one of the build options. Uh, when you set it, you get an obvious build error. With Hesiod, don't get me wrong, but it looks like it may have successfully installed on 14.1 beta 2. I am running a build option survey as we speak. Um. So there's that, and welcome, Mark. Uh, if you've got a PR related to it, great. If it's been fixed in 14 by whomever believes in that code greater yet. 
Mark. I'll just go with first names. It's easier. Not Mark J. Ah, there we go. Okay, so uh, what's this about sysrc c You feel you have either a feature request or a bug or a regression and a PR to look at. Tell the group, please. So um, when you start automating your gels, it's quite common that you use sysrc to configure them and treat uh, etcrc conf not as a normal text file, but as a key value database uh, with uh, an important interface to write to it, where you say, can say, I want these variables to hold these values, or which makes it even more useful, you can say, I want these values to be part of this uh, list of values, so that you basically use shell word splitting. And for that, the syntax is plus equals to uh, make sure some keys are in the list and like the example there. And uh, turns out the check only mode, which tells you whether the configuration you requested is already in place to make it easy to write unimportant wrappers around that to reload things as needed or to only apply configuration changes as needed even. Um, that does not take into account the set union difference uh, you have to uh, compute to compare if the value is correct because it what uh, for my attempt to go through that shell script uh, from hell it looks like uh, it does not uh, know that this is not a normal assignment but a set uh, either join or difference and then um, because of that it says no this list its old value is different from the new value and tells you that it is not as you asked just being that so it just doesn't understand the plus equals minus equals part of the operator it just treats it as a normal assignment then doing the checking okay that um, said that's you obviously a bug. you and devon have taught me more about shell than changed. anyone on earth have you looked at what the fix might be uh no Okay. Uh, and if we stumbled across it a few minutes ago. A few minutes ago. Okay, fair enough. Now I too. Um. Before yes, fourteen, Jailer was very heavily reliant on Jailist, and I, I, I didn't. I mean, I do know about Dash C, but it never figured to me that I can do something like that. So what I ended up doing is I would get, I would get the jail list without the Dash C, with, and then like parse it with. You know, for jail in jail list and grep, blah blah blah, and yep. like, you know, something like which is a very 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 bad way of doing it. Um, I, I guess doing like dash c and the plus equals in case of dash c, meaning if that is uh, contains, I think is the right term in this case, yes. right? Might be a very and it should be an easy fix because um, um, although the, the the code base is big, but it's actually very readable. There is a hack you can do in shell. You can use the shell case uh, statement uh, if you have a list like this, uh, because you do the following. You basically take the list, uh, set it to the argument vector, and then prepend and uh, append the IFS. And then you can do a basically case in, a, in um, IF, uh, star, IFS, my substring, IFS star. And then whether you basically do a linear match in the string instead of having to do a loop. So you take advantage of all the low level string processing, which your shell can do much faster than looping in shell. And you pasted some syntax. That's your workaround? That's or... the reproducer for the error. A naughty one. OK, thank you. That should just work. Oh, no, that the hack in the chat, ignore that for now. That can go last. OK, so that, that's a valid reproducer, or that's something else? No, no, the, the, the reproducer you already took from the back report. OK, got it. The, the hack down there is not the reproducer. That's something totally different. Oh, okay. Is that a future topic? Yep, but oh. one for the end. Okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, 
Mark, do you have any topics today? No worries. So that said, chime in if you got something. I would love to just talk about 14.1 in general. I personally am miffed that build options are breaking. Jan, you notice one right off the bat with Hesiod, which I believe has been broken for some time, although there's gentle evidence to the contrary. However, I think there can be false positives in all this, so they need some manual verification. Uh, the fact that perhaps Clang and Toolchain are breaking is... A new one. Usually it was like INET, INET, and INET 6 that broke. Um, and also, as I sit logged into my built fresh beta 2 install of the running the build option survey, I can't help but notice the shell when you just sort of type ls and get output and then go return to the shell does stuff like this, where the path is put after the cursor, not before. So has anyone else seen shell weirdnesses on the latest default What's root shell? One? What's that? It looks like you have some issue with your shell RC script uh, so that you're on PS1 uh, or something like that. Not. That's the default one, so maybe I do, but it ain't me. <laughs> ah, so anyway, echo. Uh if you're referring to the variable PS1, that's what I get for it. Anyway, who else has, say, 14.1 release wish list items? Uh, I was kind of hoping Doug yes, could yes, be yes, here yes, and me. we could talk about the 9P fund. Late for anything but bug fixes. Uh, well, we are... we're talking bug fixes so far. Go ahead, Antonik. What you got? Um, I am very much interested in a service feature which is oh, the following you, yes you apologies. posted that and i you, did yes you did okay tell tell the group more about that and give us a link um if i may send a link i think i can find that i'm sure i can find of course yeah i found it great okay and here is the link for that and an image with it um it's basically a button uh, sorry an option that says dash s for status and yeah. it prints an output similar to system D's list unit files, right? So it prints the service name and then the service status, service name, service status. Now, this was a, a bit of a hard to track it because um, uh, there are some services that do not maintain the Unix philosophy of like one and zero. Uh, as an as a as a return code, and some of them, for example, jail is a good example of this. When you do service uh, jail status, it will just run JLS, you know. So like you have no idea if 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 uh, uh, like what's happening with the jails basically, right? So in that case, I changed it a bit where it would like print, it would print the. Um, it would print like the jail name start like you know running jail name running jail name running, so you would see your actual jails. Uh, what else? Oh, and if you go down, there are a lot of utilities that did not respect anything in their code base because like they're tiny utilities, such such as IP six adder policy. Jan, you might remember this one. I think IP yes. something. Yeah, IP six address control, which means. Uh, what are we defaulting to? IPv4, IPv6, mm -hmm. you know, to get the policy, set the policy and stuff like that. Um, also, the ZFS keys, it just always returns zero, if I'm not mistaken, uh, regardless oh, really? of what's happening. Yeah. So anyway, I tracked down a lot of things there, and I'm sure things have changed because I was doing this work on 13.1. Um, I would like to have this in if anyone can help me out. Uh, it's I, I I think it's a neat feature in the sense. Oh, and it, it works in two ways. If you do dash, uh, the the current output is a bit the current flag is a bit different. If you do dash s, it shows all of the services, and if you do dash es, it only shows the enabled services. Oh, interesting. Uh, very similar to the way dash that e service already exists. Yeah, dash e always does the. Uh, Dash E always does the, uh, um, the the only enabled stuff, yeah. 
So uh, anyway, it's 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 a bit of a neat review, I think, and I'm I would be glad to backport it as well to thirteen dot three, uh, or whatever other thirteen branch there is. Uh, but I'm kind of stuck. Like, what what should I do next? You know, so or should are I there just, yeah. clearly daemons in RC that are not happy with it because they give ambiguous return values, and we have to chase those down individually. Um, Yes, there are. Yes, yeah, there are. Yes, there are. Okay, and are those itemized here? No, they are not. Okay, not all of them. Oh, I mean, uh, what I ended up doing is just I enabled everything. I ran it. I disabled everything. Well, okay, except whatever should be enabled uh, to make the system up and running. And then I ran it again. And then I looked at like, oh, like um, PFCTL should have reported one because it's not running. But instead, it's always reporting zero. All right. So like it is uh, well, not PFCTL, but there was something CTL in there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a, a lot of things like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what the deadline is for. Uh, it's pretty close for features. It's too late but... for that. There's always it's the next late. one and the next one and the next one and the next one. So 14 .2. Yeah. that said, could, uh, you probably have to sit down and itemize what's broken. And those are actually unrelated bugs that happen to be related because you're trying exactly. to overlay to them. So yeah. And, and that's kind of a problem in the development cycle is like, this is the feature that I want, but it also depends on these other things. And like people mail me and say, please make two PRs. I'm like, no, I don't want to. Because if someone looks at the dependent PR, they'll be like, why are you doing this? And then I have to explain again. Like, this is why I'm doing it for. So it's it's kind of a weird way of doing that. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm touching a lot of files. Overall, I'm touching okay. a lot of files. Yes, Go sir. Go ahead, Jan. I think uh, the issue is the following, and that is that you have to basically... T First, you have to... Um, be careful of what you do here because it's all stringly typed shell. And it, if you break VRC scripts, of course, you're going to break someone's boot process. Of course. But, um, it's so it's always open heart surgery and you it's shell. You will break something when you do anything non-trivial, which isn't very localized. But uh, the problem is that uh, the <laughs> RC code doesn't really uh, differentiate between different concepts, which for what you want to work correctly have to be differentiated in my opinion. That is the status for things which are demon-like with long running processes, it normally mm -hmm. tells you a list of PIDs. Mm -hmm. um, but there are lots of RC.D scripts and very valid ones, which do not correspond to uh, a running process, for example, loading the society ads. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is uh, that loading the society ads doesn't even leave a status you can later really track. Because uh, how do you know if this is the values agree because uh, you ran it? Maybe you've just set it to the default values again. Or what if the configuration is empty and it doesn't change anything because of it? Then it has finished, so you kind of have to track that. Uh, in otherwise trivial scripts like loading society, this can be more code to record that somewhere in var run uh, than um, just running society l dash f. Um, the other problem is that for this to be really useful, for example, for something like jails. Uh, you would have to have a uh, ability to check basically if the current system state is compatible or identical with the configured state. So just because I have three jails running doesn't mean that there's not a dozen of them that have crashed uh, during startup and should be running. Yes. Uh, so you kind of have to be able to basically get a list of states you're in and for example, the list of jails running in this case, and then compare the lists if they contain the same elements, basically. or if there are additional ones. So maybe you have to, is it running or is it finished? And uh, is it in sync are two different things. Mm -hmm. And 
Retrofitting that to the existing RC scripts is a problem because there are thousands of them in ports. And okay. most port maintainers are not well versed writing RC scripts. And taking uh, lots of ports have terrible RC scripts, which are several times longer than they should be, just because the uh, maintainers are too busy maintaining ports uh, to learn all the features which are already implemented for them mm -hmm. to just reuse. So there are so many ports with bad old RC scripts, which uh, could be easily cleaned up. Uh, Ironically, this is one of the justifications for, for system D in the first place in the Linux world. I, and I still Sorry? think... Ironically, this is one of the justifications for system D in the Linux world, and I'm still of the opinion that the general unit concept for daemons is actually much better than the rc.d stuff. Of course. Uh, yeah. A but, declarative uh, hey. <laughs> uh, syntax is a lot better because it's, once you have a declarative syntax instead of a script, you can reasonably have something reasoning about that state. Uh, of course, you have to provide an escape hatch to put in arbitrary code uh, or to wrap arbitrary code. After all, it's supposed to start up scripts, but um, it shouldn't be. So the systemd unit file specification is a bad one, in my opinion. Not just as the syntax actually, but the semantics aren't well thought out, especially when it comes to dependency tracking. My pet peeve is uh, wanted by as a cheap, I don't want to think about it, a form of dependency tracking uh, by ignoring the problem and just ho hoping to always win the race condition. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't think we'll okay. wage that battle here. You know, uh, we that. don't have to but, for this. Uh, that said, uh, Antrenig, do think about that D-trace header because that might be a fixable yes. regression for 14.1. But Antrenig, it sounds like you did some non-VNet, non-fancy performance testing of jail networking. And while we have Jamie, I bet you want to hear these results. What did you try? Uh, so first of all, where is our document? Damn it. Uh, here is the D-trace output to be very because you've been asking for that for a while, and I finally have You're it. You're pasting or dropping it in the Docker? What? I oh, am thank you. pasting. Great. Good man. And then we do that, and then we do... Where is the font? There we go. Okay. Yeah. So it, this, yep. is, this is the issue. Pipe def redeclaration, which is not allowed in D-Trace. In D-Trace. And this has been going since 12.4... 12.3, 12.3, I think. Yeah, uh, it's been broke. And I haven't checked before that, by the way. So it doesn't matter what you are including. Okay. As, as long as it's part of the system. Like if I include the PostgreSQL library, because I need the structs of the PostgreSQL library, it's working fine. But if the PostgreSQL library is including Sysocket, then Sysocket is including something in there then I'm getting type redeclaration, and this is the error that, that I get. Anyway, um, this is the yep. very brief, and I, I, I need a D-trace guru. Like, I, I, I can't figure this out. I well, mean, a PR is a great start to it get people like aware of it. the problem the basically the, With the header tells part. you in the end which type is redeclared. Really so yes. you have to hunt yes. for, a de for the type def for underscore, underscore, u and a, t. Yes. And I did that, and I changed it, and I just like renamed it because it was the same value, by the way. Uh, but it was the you have times. to wrap it with an if def. Yes, I did that, and then something else popped up. So basically, our uh, header include is broken with dtrace. Yeah, yeah, because it's allowed in C, but apparently not in. Uh... Or uh, DTRS does not understand the if they have wrap us correctly or something. Messy. Okay. Yes. Anything else on that topic? Can you please blast out a PR even if we don't know the fix yet? Okay. And for my jailer tests, so I yes, was uh, setting up a, setting up a server for my uh, fiance, 
and uh, we went with Volter, and I usually always get bare metal from Volter, but since this time it was a very simple uh, uh, system, I decided to use multiple IPs anyway. Um, but turns out when I'm using multiple IPs, it doesn't give me a gateway. It assigns it with a slash uh, 32 and does routing on it. Uh, and then I remembered Jan's conversation from two weeks ago, which was, hey, what you can do is you can do alias jails. I said, I said, I said to myself, hey, that's a good idea. I can try doing that. That sounds perfect. So I started doing that. And the first thing that came to my mind is a speed test. And on a very tiny VM on Volter without even a dedicated CPU, I mean, it even had a shared CPU, you know, um, I was able to achieve 30 gigabit a second. Um, oh, VM or jail? VM. VM with a yeah. shared CPU, yes. Okay. Uh, which was very, very impressive. And I posted that on, um, what's his name? I posted that on Reddit, uh, Reddit. Mm -hmm. yes. And someone came with the results of a uh, Podman uh, on Linux, which was much bigger. It was around 100 gigabit a second. Um, and uh, I kind of got uh, sad that we don't have that. So I tried again, this time on bare metal with um bare metal with uh, what's its name uh alias gels and i was able to reach 60. so it's basically uh cpu and uh cpu and memory bound as far as i can tell and yes indeed alias gels are good compared to ePair bridge i think i will be moving a lot of customers to that so, so this was just have... um my fifth, my fifth three or this is just iperf3. This is just iperf3. Uh, there is a um, <clears throat> link in Reddit. I'll send it right now. I'm trying to find it uh, right now. Yes. When you say small VM, it's a small Vulture VM with a jail in it, just to be clear for all the listeners. Uh, a small virtual uh, Vulture VM with two jails in it. Yes. Thank and you. I'm okay. doing the test between a jail and a jail. Okay. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. So, so the thing with iperf3 is you rapidly run into it's not multi, I think it's not multi core. Um, so you have to run multiple instances to test um, whether you're getting more traffic. Um, and I guess in your case, if it's alias jails, it's really just going, it's a loopback, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Did yeah. you bump up the p-value for parallel streams and such in iperf? That's or not the way to go. That's not it? Yes, that can give you artificial big numbers. That's not the relevant metric. <laughs> what would you use? Go for it. For a simple test like this, the question, how fast is a single TCP connection? It doesn't help if you spin up multiple TCP connections. <laughs> You're measuring something different. And Fair the enough. other part is, if you have a little one or two core CPU spinning up 10 uh, iperf processes, will not give you a bit, uh, an improved aggregate bandwidth because now you are, have context switching overhead. <laughs> so the, it may be a realistic benchmark uh, for other things, but just numbers go up is not the goal here. You can't just, oh, I don't like the test result. Let's change the test. That's not valid benchmarking. Yeah, I just tested it on a lightly loaded uh, Zen 2 with slow DDR4 RAM, and it runs at about 45 gigabits a second on a so a few years old Ryzen with sl slow ECC RAM, which is limiting the throughput to 45 gigabits, <laughs> peaks up to 50, uh, but yeah. But overall, I mean, um... The, the reason why I like um, uh, VNet jails is because uh, pieces of software like iPerf itself expects things like 127001, right? However, uh, when it comes to like, um, what's his name? Uh, when it comes to non-VNet jails, it doesn't see that. So it gets, it gets, it gets sad. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it does. If you run just iperf s, it's like, oh, can't do things. I'm like, okay. Then you specify the bind IP, and then it works. You see what Only, I mean? Uh, alias jails, if you try to ex use a loopback, will instead bind to the yes. primary uh, uh, IP address yes. of that family. Yeah, yeah, exactly my point. Which is, if you do it in, if you do it in, um, 
if what's his name? If you do it in VNet jails, everything works as expected. If you do it in non-VNet jails and the piece of software, like an alias jail, and the piece of software is expecting to connect to um to connect to uh uh, uh, uh local host, it's like, oh, there's something that has went wrong. Th th that's what I mean with this. Right? So like you have to uh, teach your software to not bind to that. Host, but yes. Would the, have there been any efforts to create a lightweight fake loopback device for jails? Or well, that's VNet. That well, that's <laughs> lightweight, I guess, but no, it's not lightweight if you're seeing performance issues. What what performance would you see under VNet just for our audience? Um, I've 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 never been able to get more than like seven or six, six or seven. Uh, depends on what kind of networking you're doing. Uh, if you use SIOV with uh, IOV CTL and a, and a proper mm -hmm. NIC, you can run at full line rate without a problem. Um, similar to our Beehive PCIe password, just without the pass-through part. Uh -huh. You mean that's going from um, one VNet SIOV to another VNet SIOV? On the same on a, physical box, but it has to, it's forced to go through the adapter, isn't it? It's forced to go through the hardware. No, it depends on some no. adapters where reports that you can uh, basically between virtual functions you can exceed line rate on some adapters uh -huh. because it never goes through the through. So uh, there is basically the internal switch can run faster on those cards, but of course it's in, it. Involves an interaction, but it can at least do line rate. Uh, Is that so, documented yeah. adequately somewhere? Mm, I don't think it's adequately documented because an adequate uh, documentation would state the uh, gotcha's per NIC driver and release. Uh, what has uh, you would need someone running continuous regression tests on actual hardware, which is a problem because you would need a regression test lab environment and not just users getting frustrated after a new release with regressions. <laughs> but yeah, it's a problem. Um, you can't virtualize this stuff. You need actual hardware and that costs money and mm. power and space and yep. yeah. Uh, and and... I think now I have all, all the hardware. Um, Maybe not perfect hardware, but I think I have all the stuff necessary for this. I've got, um, yeah, I've got enough hardware to do this now. I, I would really like us to find some situation where we can test this that isn't just iperf3. Um, so one mm -hmm. of the things I've got is um, so, sort of the, the largest set of data I've got that I use in, in, in production is um, a few hundred gigs of CouchDB data and it does a synchronization between nodes over HTTP, um, HTTP 1.1 pipeline connections with parallel threads. And I've never yet found that to be an actual limitation on the network. Uh, it's always been limitations somewhere else. But we need to find something like this that's related to real world, multi-stream, multi-core um, mm -hmm. transfer um, that we can use as a, as a test case. Uh, yeah, it'd be really good to see that. And you need different use cases from static file serving with Nginx uh, to uh, an NFS server to uh, just artificial mm -hmm. network benchmarks to routing tests and so on. Yeah, and behind all this, we have to remember that, that our, our Netflix friends who keep pushing um, the kernel along are cranking out 300, 400 plus gigabits a second on, on this hardware with 3BSD. So... Yeah. On the right hardware, they are doing over 800 in lab environments. Yeah, on the right hardware with a very specific use case in uh, the highly tuned. So highly, highly tuned. tuned that it's not really useful and not a relevant point of for comparison unless you have their exact use case because they find their use case so that it's possible to reach these numbers. Yeah, and they so... get input to the people who make the hardware too which also helps. 
I've thrown an intentionally naive question in there, which is like, so if FIO is supposed to model storage workloads, how do we cleverly and reproducibly model network workloads? And somehow I think Intel DPDK comes to long, mind, but maybe no. I'm completely uh, wrong uh, about uh, that. There's uh, some uh, Intel something, something K. <laughs> I do have a question though, because like yeah. this question has been killing me. Yeah. Um, say if I have a device with like three SRIOV virtual devices. So it's like total four. Usually what I do is I ignore the main one. I set one to the host and two other, I vnet them to the jail, right? And now I'm trying Good. to connect from one physical interface. I create three virtual interfaces. Mm. Okay. So I ignore the main device. So let's say EM0 for sake of example. Um, I assign one of them to the host and I set like, you know, the IP address of the host and two of them go to vnetted jails. Okay. Now, if I'm connecting from a jail to a jail, does it go to the switch and then come back? No. Do you see what I mean? It should take just the detour within the NIC and its firmware. Okay. Uh, okay. It should not leave uh, the it should, machine. Not it should must. not must. Exactly. You could have a branded okay. implementation. Okay, because in, in our scenario, we're using the, um, Michael might remember, it, the X770, the Intel cards, which we had huge issues with, with and we changed them to uh, Chelsea. I haven't tested the Chelsea, by the way, with uh, virtual functions yet. But with that, I was looking on the traffic in the Microtech switch that it was connected to, and it was going out and coming back in. I was thinking, is this like a should I is there like a tunable or a loader configuration? Or yeah, or the 710. Maybe that the card just doesn't do it, but some cards supposedly implement their own internal switch. Okay. Uh, Dream logic, others may just throw it out and expect the hardware switch to send it back to them. Okay. Then okay, you're loading your own port. This unless you have a very uh under provision switching ASIC, right? Okay. It's not that Got bad, it. but yeah. Got because okay. uh, you're not sending out lots of broadcast and multicast traffic, right? Mm -hmm. You're sending unicast mm -hmm. traffic. Exactly, yeah. Okay, I'll try that. I'll try that. I'll try that. And uh, one sure. more thing that um, I did test, by the way, when I was playing with the uh, jails, uh, I totally forgot about this. Um, when I was testing on Azure, uh, Azure has what they call like very secure VPCs, which means you can't do the uh, Mac spool thing or like, you know, use your own Mac address. Um, uh, so, but what Azure, and I don't know about the other clouds, but I had free credits on Azure, so I wanted to play there. Um, on Azure, you can say, hey, this network card, and they have like an object type NIC. Some clouds don't do this. They only say like device or VM, but Azure has a NIC and you can move the NIC from one VM to another, right? So it, it moves all of the configuration with it. On that NIC, I said that this NIC is supposed to have this IP address, this IP address, and this. so I, I put all of my jail IP addresses on that NIC, and with VNet, it didn't work because it shows a different MAC address, but without the VNet, when you use the um, alias jails, uh, it worked fine, it worked perfectly without any issues, and it was also able to reach the 10 gigabit per second. Um, I, as, I, as far as I understood, the, the, the new HN driver can reach 10 gig on Hyper-V. Um, HN? Yeah, HN, yes. That's the, that's the, that's the Hyper-V Hyper -V virtual NIC, yes. Mm. Um, I don't know if it's different. On 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 premise Hyper V versus the Azure, but I did test on Azure. I'll trust. I'll I'll test on Windows as well over the weekend. Yeah, just to make sure that we have that a lot of Hyper V deployments on the planet. Unfortunately, so uh, with some NICs it matters because uh, with uh, SIOV you normally have both the physical NIC interface and then the virtual one. So for the switching, it may matter if you're basically on the host if you keep on using the physical uh, interface for the host, or if you give it with one of the virtual interfaces. So on some drivers, I think uh, just mm -hmm. uh, as one of them, uh, you should create the right type of virtual device, otherwise you may lose a mm -hmm. bunch of uh, NIC features and mm -hmm. offloading features. 
and uh, the BSD router project has documentation on that in our wiki. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jan, since we're on the topic of networking, I was thinking to ask you. So one of the setups that I'm doing right now is uh, WireGuard with the table feature off so it doesn't modify the routing tables. And Good then idea. and then what I do is I was, I'm was i running BGP, in this case specifically OpenBSD's OpenBGPD uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in unicast mode because WireGuard doesn't do broadcast. BGP is um, always unique. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and and then that's it. And now I have all of the routing tables available. And um, the only thing left beneath it was setting that to allow everything between all of the WireGuard instances. Because, you know, if one of the devices is down, it might route differently. So I don't want the or WireGuard config to disallow that, so to say. Um, is, does that make sense or should I? It makes a lot of sense. What you can okay. do is the easy way uh, is to just configure your WireGuard uh, interfaces as true point to point interfaces so that each interface has only a single peer and the allow IP list is set to okay. zero uh, slash zero and colon colon slash zero mm -hmm. so that the crypto uh, routing layer inside the WireGuard interface is effectively disabled because mm -hmm. all IP addresses are always routed to the one P on that interface. If mm -hmm. you want to do a point to multipoint, you would have to do some hackery uh, to uh, take a look at the routing information base, look up the uh, next hop IP address on the WireGuard interface and then find all the um, indirect routes through that next top and put them in the allowed IPs and then only should you uh, update it. So with Got something it. like BERT2, you may be able to do that, um, but it would be Got it. annoying yes. to maintain okay. this and basically a next hop to public key peer mm -hmm. mapping. Mm -hmm. And unless you have Hundreds of peers, I wouldn't bother. I would just create yes. interfaces, give them reasonable names, and call it a day. Yeah, I was. I was also. One, I mean, this it's kind of free BSD. But does anyone know if OpenBGPD works on macOS? It would be dope if I can have. Yeah, yeah, if I can have OpenBGPD <laughs> running on my laptop, then when I VPN, I can just set the routes with BGP. And then finally, I can, uh, like all of my local VMs would appear to other parts in, of my infrastructure when I'm using Telescale or WireGuard, you know, because th that sounds also very interesting. Yeah, um, I don't think anyone maintained it years, years ago, I think a decade or so ago, someone got OpenGPD mm. working, but back then the BSD routing socket implementations were closer together because the Relevant operating systems had uh, not that far diverged as they are now. Um, back when so many okay. differences, there yeah, that the okay. basics are probably compatible. Mm -hmm. But all the I'll I'll, I'll try cases, to compile it. I'll because they have the Open BGPT portable. Uh, yeah, yeah, wow. I'll try to compile it and, and report because well, this would be very neat. Fresh, the, so getting it to compile happen. to the point that you can run a BGP speaker as in a route reflector or something on a, a Mac is probably very feasible but mm -hmm. syncing it with the kernel routing table uh, yeah, that's <laughs> going to be a bit of work to get that reliable and the next question is why would your uh, Mac or any little uh, leaf node on your network require a B full BGP session? Hmm. Can't you aggregate that uh, and then use basically to all your different entry points to your whatever kind of mesh, you have two or three of them, and then use the uh, uh, WireGuard hook scripts to uh, just install the aggregate routes uh, to mm -hmm. the one, and then if a node fail, the end basically the dial endpoint fails itself check, like loses its BGP session, then mm -hmm. it just disables its wire guard, kicks off the uh, client, and they would pick another server. 
it's, yeah. it's probably a lot easier to get working instead of having every, especially when you have more than just your Mac, but someone else has a Linux machine, someone else has a Windows machine, then what else? Linux, Windows, what's all of these things? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but in that case, uh, and you would have to install all of these customizations on each uh, client. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a centrally managed uh, FreeBSD jail server or something like that, it makes total sense. But I would, I would just recommend that you uh, keep the clients as dumb as possible. And I see some mention of Darwin in their code, but I'll leave that to the reader because we're a little straying from our topics. Um, I don't know, that conversation last week about the hardware offloading and exactly when it takes place and when it does not and can it be turned on and off? And do you either get no traffic or corrupt traffic? Left uh, struck a chord with me. Uh, Andrew Thompson threw in a comment that I put here. And if there's any documentation out there, that would be great because so far everyone I'm talking to is like, oh yeah, they don't teach this. It's a new feature and have a nice day. So there I said it. Other topics before we get to Jan's shell trickery. Uh, be it Mark, Mohammed, Jamie, Dan, Dave, what you got? This is your call, not mine. Nothing here. I'm still playing with the new net SNMP stuff, which while not jail specific will affect anyone using it. Um, I'm not, not sure what it is, but um, the extend feature I'm having uh, data I'm having extend stuff disappear from the running SNMP instance. So I'll run discovery on it once. The extend data is there. Run it again later and by later, I don't mean right again later. I mean hours or days later and it's gone restarting the daemon brings it back, but I don't know why it disappears in the first place. Uh, is that something you've, that's worthy of a PR and have you filed it or you're still? Uh, yeah, I'm talking, there's no PR, but I'm talking with the maintainer and the person oh. that did the upgrade already. Excellent. Uh, um, it is particular. It may be particular to SNMP v3, which is the off and priv option. Um, I have no evidence that it, it applies to SN, SNMP v1 or v2 because I'm not using it, but it definitely affects v3. Ah, uh, yeah, Mark, it sounds like you have to go, but hey, if it's obvious towards the end of the, calls, of the calls, they can get a little off topic, but it's all good stuff because it's all eventually interrelated. So if you do have something quick that's just biting at you, let us know. If not, we will see what Jan has up his sleeve. So nothing, Mark. Okay. Jan, let her rip. What you got? Have you again solved a problem I didn't know I had? So um, maybe um, if I looked into using config in it from Colin Percival uh, to um, configure jails, uh, that we roll a jail back to a snapshot and then uh, apply config in it. Um, but config in it is locked away uh, inside of his EC2 support scripts and the rc.d script for it only uh, supports um, the EC2 uh, configuration service to fetch the configuration from. So you, it would need a custom rc.d script anyway. So I looked into it and it's only 50 lines. So I decided instead to rewrite it. Um, and add change root uh, prefix and jail support. 
so that you can have a root directory to uh, prepend to stuff or to um, change root into a directory and that now works. And one of the things I wanted to do is inside the jail to then uh, basically have a file to specify what should be configured via sysrc. And uh, it was a bit annoying to write that as a shell script and um, uh, not at all. Um, so we um, instead of what I did is I used uh, the env command to split the um, interpreter and its arguments like it used to be in FreeBSD 8, but it's no longer because everyone else doesn't split the arguments here, but passes all the arguments as the second argument and then the third is basically the path. So what it, this does is use env to split the sh command uh, to then have in the shebang line the embedded shell script to slurp in this file which is normally the source code for the script and feed it into a sysrc so that you have a one liner you put on top of it and then afterwards just um, sysrc lines so, so what was this for jan i, I missed the bit where um, um... What is so the that problem I that I have a file which if I act is executable. Uh, I executed it and it applies ch these changes with sysrc like in shell script, but that I is easier to auto generate because uh, basically the sysrc arguments and the shell code is split up into the first line and then the data. All right. Okay. So it's it's um have an executable thing that applies changes that look just like they would in the script and it should do the right thing for us. Yes, so what it does is basically the first thing is to redirect standard in to the source code for the script. That's the exec yeah. part here. Exec with no arguments is just for redirect. Then read one line to discard it, empty the command line argument list, uh, read lines while there are lines and append them to the argument list. When it's done, it checks if the last line was incomplete, so lacking a new line. Uh, if so, it also adds that. And then it just xx with dollar $add uh, into sysrc. It's a bit naughty to put all of that in this place, but the advantage is that now basically the, yeah, the parser and the uh, data are split, and that can just work like a shell script now. But basically, a, yeah, um, interpreter is a shell script. Sorry for cutting your conversation. Does anyone remember where do we have the Poudrier reports that we run on pkg.freebsd.org for the packages that are not compiling or anything like that? There's two places. The easiest is to look on fresh ports. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Um, which is an overview. And if you want to look at the really dirty details, there's a bunch of servers called Beefy, and um, you kind of need to know which Beefy you're looking for. Um, I will find a document that references these and, and send it to you. But start yeah. off with fresh. What you need? Then, we, yeah. we used to get we used to get reports right as part of the Erlang team if Erlang is not compiling or Elixir or anything like that. But I, I, I don't remember getting these reports anymore. No, I'm I guess always... we I fixed them, I guess. <laughs> there shouldn't oh. be anything. <laughs> <They're like, Or laughs> <that>. <laughs> if it doesn't work, and like in a day later, I know because I can't compile something and I get annoyed. Yeah. yeah. Um, those come to um, package fallouts and they turn up on the Erlang at previous list, but mm -hmm. um, there haven't been any for a while. Mm, yeah, I typically see. what happens is we'll get a we'll get a a few when ODP twenty seven lands because mm -hmm. I don't have all the very hardware to test that on. But but now mm -hmm. I test on like AD um sixty four and ARM sixty four and that covers most mm -hmm. things anyway. So uh, I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. Well, on fresh ports, because my students are texting me, Plasma 6, Plasma Desktop. I First of all, they're amazed. They're like, oh, FreeBSD already has KDE 6. I'm like, yes, I don't know who's spreading the myth that our packages are outdated. They are not. They just don't change from quarterly to latest, and then they start complaining, you know? 
there's a, been a new version of Elixir that's been out for over a day and I haven't committed it yet. It's appalling. We're so over far a day. Oh my God. Over a day. Can you believe this? <laughs> Uh, okay, okay, that sounds good. Okay, I'll have a look because apparently KDE six, the desktop, is not working on AMD sixty four according to fresh ports. Uh, maybe something got broken there, and I have no idea how to check any of this, but I'll, I'll figure it out. AMD uh, thank you. In case anyone was wondering what config in it does, it's, it's basically a way to do initial configuration of a FreeBSD system. It can do the following things. It can re replace a file. It can append to a file. It can run a shell script. Or uh, it, anything which isn't one of the three, it uh, tries to untar using FreeBSD's tar. So anything lib archive understands, it can unpack and then recurses into that. So you can uh, char a collection of configurations up and then put it in the directory again and recursively wrap it in tars. Uh, so it's tars, not turtles all the way down. Cool. And it's a way so that you can have a very simple script for to do yeah, first startup style configuration, like run package install, uh, pick the right package repository branch, um, enable SSHD and stuff like that. And with the right rc.d script on EC2, you can basically, in the, the web interface, you can upload a configuration file, you upload the tar and uh, then it gets applied on first boot or depending on the configuration on every boot. Other topics. Wait, that's the wrong spot. What you got, people? Um I think there's not not much else. Oh yeah, my 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 migration process sorry, my updating week got delayed to this week because oh, right. scientists kicking people yeah, off from and being last able to week. play around. Yeah, because scientists are like, we have long running jobs. We have to do it over the weekend. I said, mm. okay, fine. I'll just do it next week. Um, so yeah, I, I'll I'll do I'll keep doing that and let you know how all of that. Go. And yeah, Jan, I'll also try the um, Intel Seven Pen X Seven Ten with SRIOV. See how that works too. But I'm honestly still impressed with the alias GL speed. Like it's 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 uh, uh, for 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 clusters and such. It's it it looks and sounds amazing, and uh, specifically for scientific purposes, when like they're moving a lot of files back and forth, it it just sounds very interesting. Uh, has uh, that changed in twenty four years? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man, but you know, the only thing yeah. now is petabytes are not as big as they used to be. Yeah, the what? P petabytes are not as big as they used to be. People's right. expectations. Yeah. Exactly. How long it takes yeah. to get the petabyte? Has dropped. Yeah. Um, if you do the SR over IOV stuff, I, I'd love to know. I've got some SROV capable hardware, but never really knew what I would use it for. I mean, I know what I'd use it for, but never really got off the ground of going, okay, this is how you set it up. So, okay. Uh, and the, 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 Dave, are you still renting or do you own that? I, I, I own, I've, so I've got, I've got both. So I've got okay. stuff I own in the seller, which I've had for, I don't know, four or five years at least. Um, mm -hmm. And I have um, access to some E810 uh, okay. Intel NICs as well. But I think they only got up to 25 gigs. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Michael, if you go to my blog, on tronicv.am, I totally forgot about this. I blogged about it, I think, over the weekend during the conference. Um, it's about bare metal free BSD on Volter. I totally forgot about this. Um, so let me see. I, I'm sure... Is my blog down because I was doing updates? No, it's not. Okay, we're good. It, it's there. Okay. So uh... I already dropped your link in the beginning. <laughs> oh, oh really? Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's uh Volt. So Volter, I mean, they, they removed free free BSD from the from the what's its name? From the uh, bare metal options. 
And I talked with support about the reason for that. And they're like, hey, man, like ZFS is nice. But like when we're doing disk cloning, it doesn't look so well because the GUID is might, might get replicated and stuff like that. And it's very hard to do provisioning over, um, over IPMI. However, we still support IPXE. So here's the process. You get a VM, any VM, Ubuntu, Linux, doesn't matter. Uh, you download the MFS BSD file into it, and then you do SAN boot, which Vulter does support, and most, if not all, cloud pro because SAN, SAN boot has been there for like ten years at this point in in the IPXC standard. Uh, you just put the you put, just put the link of, of of the file, and then it boots, and everything is fine. You log in with MFS root, MFS root, yes, MFS root, and the rest is BSD install. It brings the very familiar installation process, and you can continue from there. MFS. Um, MFS. I'm, I'm trying my computer okay. slow. Sorry. It's okay. One of the um, things you may be able to improve is to use HTTP boot. HTTP it, it, oh, What do you mean? You already do. I, I the support HTTP boot, so you can. No, this is doing over like HTTP. Yeah, I found it. Uh, <laughs> Because it's common to use NFS or uh, oh no no which is no a lot slower mm. yeah no no or no requires this, this... More bespoke mm. uh, network environment yeah and I also did boot the big image of MFS BSD the one that already has base and kernel inside of it so like you're not downloading or doing network configuration or anything you're just like hey regular install just like a regular cd you know and mm -hmm. what i like is that um that domain whoever that is i won't i Martin can I, can I, or was or I don't know can, I, can, I, can i can i buy them coffee you know like they're producing mfs bsd on every release and they're keeping the archives as well nice. so that's good yeah uh, but volter for security reasons they didn't allow me to set the Martin. url of Sushka. of of the domain directly like I couldn't do SAN boot from mfsbsd.vx.sk. That's why I needed a separate VM. So like they're like, oh, you can boot from the Volter infrastructure, but not from the outside, uh, which, which is fine, I guess. And uh, they also have MFS Linux if you want to do like Gen 2 or something like that yeah. on bare metal. Um, but yeah, it was it was MFS really easy. Linux, and... No kidding. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. It was really good. It booted fine. I also tested with UEFI, MBR, GPT, non-UEFI, regular BIOS, all of the possible setups. Uh, the default works, which is GPT with BIOS. The mm. UEFI did not work on on Volter's bare metal. I'll check other bare metals as well if if I, I don't know if I have any access. But yeah, it was very much a simple process and uh, loved it. Now I'm very happy. Now I can deploy FreeBSD very fast uh, on bare metals. Uh, but the, all, the only thing, plug, the only thing that's sad is that in the user interface, the logo set changed from the FreeBSD logo to like a disk logo, which means like custom operating system. Now I'm gonna do like feature request. Can I upload my custom logo, please, or like assign one of no. your logos? So I just want to see the FreeBSD logo in there. <laughs> so Antonik, just touching back on. Two things. One, you wrote a blog post about this, did you? Yes. That's awesome. Great. I will steal it. Secondly, you mentioned that um if I understood rightly I, that Vulture I did, did I did I did I did read your blog too, by the way, because you had also oh, about IPXE boot. Yeah, I probably have um a newer one under works but partially finished with HTTP boots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll dig that out and send it through. Um so if I understand this, Vulture said they can't support FreeBSD on ZFS because when they clone the images, the Zipple GUID remains the same. Is that correct? Yes. The default it is. But there's a there's a there's a fix for that. Literally there's a part of the, sort of the general cloudware stuff is a thing that says on first boot change the GUID of the pool. So if that's the only reason oh. you've got a ticket, for me the ticket and I'll hook them up with the um with the magical things we need. Um we do this on all the other cloud providers as well. Yeah. Oh, nice. the same I'll, I'll let them yeah. know. Do the cloud providers provide an identifier you could use for the VM so that mm -hmm. they have a guaranteed unique identifier per tenant uh, namespace for VMs? Well, you don't need a per tenant then... namespace. Just do it for every boot. Every VM that starts will get its own GUID. Yeah, of course, you can do it with the first boot sentinel file and so on. Yeah. Uh, but what I wondered is, is, do you have some kind of 
ID you could take and extract via CCDL or SM BIOS infos or something. Some ID you could hand in. So and, that you um, know which GUID is supposed to be on the disk and you fix it the first time you use it and then it stays there. And the next and when you export it, you can through the API if it was ever used, you know that this is supposed to be the GUID. So if you want to import it by that, you have a stable identifier instead of just generating a random 64-bit ID and hoping you're not going to observe 64-bit uh, ID collisions. Which, I don't think there's uh, anybody who's created enough VMs to have that problem with ZFS. <laughs> And uh, what the, the, the other thing that was also interesting is it was like the, the end goal for me with this bare metal setup on Voltor is um, you boot up the operating system always from IPXE, which a lot of, if not all, cloud providers allow that. And then I would like to have like jailer OS, quote unquote, where it would read the jail configuration and firewall and everything like that from the disks, because the disks are always the same. But let's say that there's a new FreeBSD, you just reboot the machine, and now you have the new FreeBSD, you know, running on top of that uh, while your jails are running as they're supposed to. So very similar to SmartOS is what I'm trying to achieve here. Um, and, and hopefully it, it, it might become a reality, especially with package base. It might even be interesting to update the jails with package base as well. So yeah, uh, th th that behavior could be interesting to, to, to have. Uh, and I also did try to boot um, SmartOS from MNXIO, uh, the new maintainers on the same bare metal with their with the IPXE images that they provide, and it also looked fine. But basically, the cloud was a bad idea. We're just going back to bare metal to solve all of our problems. You know, this is very weird. <laughs> um, no, the the way the cloud is implemented is a problem. This, yeah. uh, I want compute and storage as a service is a good idea. The way we did it is uh, atrocious. But um, what you can do in FreeBSD is you can compile an MFS image, so uh, a memory file system image, uh, into the kernel. The problem is that you can't unload it, so that memory is gone for the runtime of a kernel, and you can't replace the kernel without a real reboot. So you want to keep so it as small like, as possible. What you can do is what? So we have reroute. So you're right. The memory is lost, but we can reroute. So you might lose a hundred megs of memory, maybe a bit more, maybe a couple of hundred. You can it keep it even how... smaller. The trick here is that you, if that you only have enough in there, either you do a traditional. Uh, uh, NFS root as your first root FS stage, and then we root into a. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, how do you do that? Sorry, how do you do what part of it? Rerouting. Uh, you set a sysctl. Oh, no, a kernel environment variable. I have a shell script and rc.t script to basically do it for jelly full disk encryption so that you have uh, one pool which is unencrypted and one which is encrypted on a jelly encrypted provider. And then you boot into the unencrypted system so that you don't need a trusted system console, SSH in. Uh, it just asks you for a key. When you unlock the, it, it saves it and then basically it mounts the plain text system somewhere under slash plane or somewhere. Uh, so that you have both uh, user lens visible and you can change root into the other one to update it. Um, what you have to do is the uh, root dot, uh, let me change the amount from something. There's a kernel environment variable where basically the kernel looks up its uh, root file system and you change that kernel environment variable and then do a reboot dash R which basically uh, kills all user land processes okay. and runs all file systems, including the root file system. But instead okay. of rebooting or shutting down, the kernel looks for a new root file system according to the current uh -huh. value of this envi kernel environment. Is, is that the... Um, it starts in you in it. Uh, yeah. Uh, exactly. What was that? Uh, VFS, VFS root mount. Root mount. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. oh that's interesting. 
the that main kernel part is working. that you oh, can't. But, but same kernel, code. right? Same kernel, yes, same different. Kernel. Okay. You can change everything but the kernel. You can load and unload kernel modules if they're unloaded. Why didn't I know about this? Because now I can be happy for using Supermicro, which boot takes mm -hmm. around 15 minutes. You know, I don't have to wait for post anymore. Uh, if it takes 15 minutes, you probably want to disable a bunch of option ROMs. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, if you have a NUMA system uh, and it does the memory enumeration through the NUMA system or from one core enumerates the memory on the other sockets, it's fucking slow. Um, you can also define your own kernel environment variables. I use one to save the old uh, value so that then the um, Encrypted uh, user lend knows uh, where it's unencrypted boot part is, so that you have the same slash boot file system, so that you have only one uh, slash boot directory for the kernel to update and one uh, slash boot loader config so on, and don't have to keep them in sync because there is just one. And that uh, is not supported by BSD install to set it up like that, but it is safe to update using that uh, once you've conf it configured in that way. Um, you could use this to have a very small system and one neat trick if you know about it, in your root file system, you can have uh, n mount con file, uh, which configures the uh, 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 mount con file, which configures uh, has to be uh, this path in the root file system. Uh, so slash dot mount dot conf. And uh, mm -hmm. there you can have it uh, try a list of different opera, uh, basically root paths before it uh, fails to some callback, either rebooting in a loop or uh, rebooting, uh, retrying infinitely, uh, hanging there, set it, sitting at a prompt or whatever. So you can have a sequence where you barely try this first and if this doesn't work do something else so that you get to a fallback user land where you can then or that you can have something like try the is an upgrade for this machine scheduled first and then yeah it's been there for a few years i think it came in with 9.0 or something and yeah Yep. And yep. Hmm. You can also use this to have the kernel uh, create MD devices from files in the current root file system to use as the next root file system. So basically, you can use the boot file system and have in there a, a ZSTD compressed image of a read only file system, have geom use it loaded, and use the geom. which can keep memory footprint down because you get to use that STD compression. Yeah, it's, uh, there are a bunch of things you can do. Uh, the one thing you can't do is without doing a real reboot, replace the kernel. Hmm. So no uh, kernel upgrades for you, no, no up kernel updates, which cannot be done by just unloading and reloading loading kernel modules. Mm. It would be nice if you could in some way uh, protect the tempfs <laughs> then, uh, but doing rerouting you lose by uh, the, the moment you unmount the tempfs, it's gone. You cannot reroute into a tempfs or through a tempfs. You have to use a the old fashioned way with an empty device. But yeah, but other than that, it's totally possible. The uh, latest or second to latest uh, FreeBSD journal also has an article on SIIOV. Oh, really? Oh, good to know. Okay. Yep. Uh... But um, other than that, yeah. Mm. Other topics and 
Dan L, you dropped a hint that you are looking for help for a certain site mentioned several times today. Oh, yeah. uh, I'll, what I'll, form I'll, should that take? Yes, always looking for people to start helping the transition from me running Fresh Ports exclusively to a group running it. Uh, there is a list.freshports.org oh, right. mailman site and get on the coders mailing list and say, hi, I'd like to help. This is the kind of stuff I know how to do. And if there's stuff you'd like to learn how to do, let us know and we'll try and teach you that. Cool. Yeah, I'm trying to find that journal article if you happen to have it. Great. Yeah, they've had discoverability issues for quite some time. Let's see. Other topics, questions, you name it. Oh, you're quick. Copy link. Thank you. Just one small thing regarding MFS BSD. There's a couple of patches um, in uh, on on Fabricator that bring um, Martin's functionality into, um, I guess, into the main FreeBSD source tree. And I will dig the links up to those and drop them in. Uh, I guess in Michael's document. Um, sure, please. So. I actually haven't tested them yet. I've got them in and use it, but I've not had the time to sit down and work through how to make them spit out images. Thank you for that link to the article. It's now in context. I dug up the link to the yep. HTML version Likewise. instead of the oh, index. What, yeah. what do I have? PDF or no? I don't know. Let's see. It is hopefully HTML and discoverable. I hope the robots.txt keep the world from seeing it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now, Anox Connect X4, Chelsea X710DA, here we go. It's a, that's, that's the usual suspects. Great. Antranig, you've seen that? Check it out. And because you're not passing through with virtual devices, none of the IO MMU troubles should trigger because the IMO, uh, MMU doesn't have to be used uh, between virtual functions on the same kernel, basically. At least it shouldn't have to be used so that uh, then maybe it works without issues even on the problematic ROM boards. Yes, Cool. Okay. Anything else or shall we call it? Called. Called. Awesome. Antrenig, you want do you want to do the honors? Like did we lose him? We lost him. Yes. Like and subscribe, everyone. <laughs> Have a great one. Talk to you soon. And this is where you say bye, and I say bye, and I'm all right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Kidding.